The Whistler. That whistle is your signal, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the Whistler's strange story, A Mask for Kinsella. Jim Kinsella couldn't seem to fix the beginning in his mind. If there was a beginning, it was all too confused. Like impressions out of a dream. Patches of thought and action bouncing back at him. The excitement, the shouted warning. And then the explosion that rocked the small chemical laboratory and sent the world crashing down on him. They were dim at first, the voices. Very faint. But growing stronger, growing stronger and coming closer all the time. Is he coming around, Doctor? Yes, you'll be all right. I still do not understand how the laboratory blew up that way. Gradually, through it all, something was coming back, clearing in his mind. It had to do with his friend Ted, Ted Brewster the laboratory deep in the Mexican wilderness where the two of them were. Yes, Jim Kinsella remembered now how he'd gone back again into the lab after Ted, who shouldn't have been there at all that night. How he had risked the flames as Ted shouted hopelessly for help. This is Jim, Ted. Where are you? Easy, easy, my boy. Don't try to talk. Doctor, what's he trying to say? What, what happened? Oh, now it's, it's all right. You're perfectly safe. Where am I? They brought you here to the hospital yesterday, after the accident out at your laboratory. Yesterday? Dr. Bowman, he's been doing everything for you. Dr. Bowman? That's right, my boy. Now try to get to sleep for a while. Quiet now. I I don't seem to remember exactly what happened. Oh, of course. You had a bad shock. It'll be a while before you recover fully. Your memory will be hazy for some time. But these bandages, I, I can't see. No, no. You had better get some sleep. Before too long, we'll remove these bandages. See what sort of a job I've done, eh? Job? On your face. It was a bit cut up, but don't worry. I've taken care of it. Just get some rest now. Yeah. Yeah, get some rest. <laughs> You can't sleep, can you, Jim? Thinking about Ted. Without asking, you know that Ted Brewster is dead. You remember now, finding him in the wreckage of the laboratory. It's all you can think about in the days that follow. That and how fortunate you are to be alive. Then the day finally comes when Dr. Bauman decides it's time to remove your bandages. All right, now. We shall see, eh? We will cut the bandages, miss. Yes, doctor. Here, help me unwind this. That's it. Gently. Gently. It's like coming up for air, Doctor. A new life. I'm certain you will be pleased with what we've done. Well, I'm alive. That's enough for me. Good. That's the way to feel about it. Oh, no, it's, uh, just cut this adhesive here. Yes, sir. That's it. That's it. And look. Oh. <laughs> Don't I get a look, too? Uh, get me that mirror, nurse. Yes. Here you are. Thank you. Well, that'll be all for now. You may go, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor. Well, there are some scars, but I'm sure we can take care of them later. Oh, just so I got a face, doctor. Yeah, uh, you have, and a very good one, my boy. Here. The mirror. See for yourself. Oh, thanks, I... No, no, 
don't worry about those scars. I warned you about them, but they'll clear up. Oh, no. No, it isn't. Uh, what is it? What's the matter, Mr. Brewster? Mr. Brewster. He's calling you Mr. Brewster, isn't he, Jim? Yes. Because that's who he thinks you are. The realization races through your mind. He's made a mistake, Jim, a terrible mistake. And you're certain you know how it happened. In accomplishing his plastic surgery on your face, he must have worked from photographs of your friend, Ted Brewster, who was killed in the explosion. And the doctor's result is a well-fashioned replica of Ted's face. Mr. Brewster, have you forgotten what you look like? No. No, Dr. Baumer. Then what is wrong? He's asking you what's wrong, Jim. The man who's given you a new identity, a new face. And suddenly, something makes you decide that it isn't wrong after all. It might be the kind of thing you've been waiting for all your life. Yes, suddenly the thought hits you. With his explanation that there might be blank spots in your memory, your mind might fog out on occasion. It could make it simple, couldn't it? Simple to pass yourself off as the wealthy Ted Brewster. Mr. Brewster, you haven't answered me. You sit and remember what you look like, don't you? Is your mind blanking out? No, no, Doctor. I, I'm all right. You're satisfied then, Mr. Brewster? Yes. I think you've done a perfect job for me. Perfect. With the prologue of A Mask for Kinsella, another strange story by The Whistler. It's perfect, isn't it, Jim? This thing that's happened to you. The mistake Dr. Bauman has made. He's created a mask for you. A mask for Kinsella. And you're sure you know just how it happened. In repairing the damage to your face, Dr. Bauman, working from photographs of Ted, fashioned an almost perfect replica of Ted Brewster. And in a moment of terrible decision, you decided to leave it that way. Ted was killed in the explosion. But he had money back in the States. And a wealthy aunt in San Diego who hasn't seen him for years. It's a gamble, isn't it, Jim? Posing as Ted Brewster. But knowing what you do of his past, what he's told you, you're certain there's a good chance you'll get by with it. The slow motor trip to the airport gives you time to think it through. Consider everything, including Mrs. Kinsella, your own wife in Mexico City. But your mind is made up. Somehow it was from the very first. And at the airport, you bid Dr. Bauman goodbye. Well, Dr. Bauman, it's the end of the line. I, I can't thank you enough. End of the line? Oh, don't say that, my boy. All this may be the beginning for you. Uh, yes, it may be at that, Doctor. Flight 24 for the West, El Paso, Amarillo, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Passengers will board the plane at gate number three, please. Yeah, that's me, Voice West. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Brewster. Ted? Something in his tone, Jim. The way he said the name makes you wonder, doesn't it? Wonder if Dr. Bauman realizes he's made a mistake. That you're not Ted Brewster after all. You dismiss the thought long before the flight ends. Because if he knew anything was wrong, he would surely have said something, at least to you. Yes, Jim, any fears or doubts you might have had are wiped away by the joyous greeting you receive at San Diego Airport from Ted Brewster's aging aunt. Oh, Ted. Ted, my boy, so many years and now to see you. You're not uh, disappointed, Aunt Louise? No, no, of course not. My, my face, it isn't too pretty. Aunt. Oh, stop that talk right now, do you hear? It's you and you're alive and back. That's all that matters to us. Us? Oh, you've forgotten. Uh, Aunt Louise, the, the doctor, he said that I'd have 
trouble for a while. My my memory. He said there'd be occasional lapses, blank spots. I understand. But I still have a surprise for you, even if you don't remember. Judy Adams. Judy... Oh, yes. I uh, always thought a lot of her. Uh, Judy! Judy! Yes, Over here, dear. Ted. Ted. Dear, Ted's just explained something you should know about. He's going to have the... Uh, what is it, Ted? Blank spots? Uh, yeah, temporary amnesia, kind of. Hello, Judy. Ted. Oh, Ted. Do I look all right to you? You look wonderful. <laughs> Blank spots and all. Oh, Ted, it's so good to have you back. Come on now, children. We're going home, the three of us, together. The worst is over, isn't it, Ted? You've been accepted. It's a lucky thing you said you remember Judy. And her attitude makes your position stronger than ever. Only you have to be careful. Always on guard. Like the afternoon when you're walking with her in the garden at Aunt Louise's home. Oh, it's pleasant here, isn't it, Judy? Yeah. I've always wanted a place like this. I mean, uh, I've always enjoyed this garden. Ted. Yes? You don't really remember this garden, do you? No, I... I guess not. Well, before you went away, we went walking here. But, well, that's close to ten years ago, isn't it? Yeah, I... I guess it is, Judy. <laughs> Gosh, Judy, this uh, this must be kind of rough on you. I, I mean, the way my mind does these flip-flops, remembering one day, forgetting the next. Oh, it's all right. Only... What? Nothing, Dad. Nothing at all. Her attitude worries you, doesn't it? You wonder if something you've done or said has made her suspicious. But a few evenings later, it seems to be all right. Well, Ted, how does it feel to be back in the nightclub again? Oh, okay. <laughs> Feels fine. I'd forgotten what it was like. You, uh, you don't remember this place, do you? Uh, vaguely. Uh, I'm afraid I've forgotten a lot of things, Judy. My, my mind's still pretty much of a blank. I know. The accident must have been a terrible shock. Yeah, you you just have to bear with me, I'm afraid. Of course. I understand, Ted. Ted? Yeah? I thought you were taking me to Tony's for dinner. Oh, well, sure, I... <laughs> but you just drove right past it. Oh. I, I'm sorry, Judy. I, I just wasn't thinking. I'm in that fog again. It's all right, Ted. I know. It's been a convenient excuse, hasn't it, Jim? Those moments, all too many of them, when your mind becomes clouded. It helps you cover up when you make a mistake. And you're certain now that Judy isn't suspicious at all. Everything is going well, and you become more and more confident as days pass. Then, one afternoon, as you return to the house, there was someone here to see you a little while ago. To, to see me, Aunt Louise? Who was it? Didn't leave his name. Emily told him you'd be back before evening. What did he want? Didn't mention. Emily said he was tall, heavy set man. Said he looked like a Seamus. What? Seamus. That's what Emily called him. A detective. Goodness, I don't know where Emily picks up these strange phrases. What's the matter, Ted? Uh, nothing, Aunt Louise. Nothing. The news is more than a little disturbing, isn't it, dear? And you wonder if Emily, Aunt Louise's housekeeper, was right, thinking the man who called at the house was a detective. That evening at dinner, he's still on your mind, isn't he? You're hardly listening to Ted's aunt as she chatters on gaily. And then something she says penetrates your thoughts. Hmm? Uh, what did you say? I said, how long do you think you can go on trying to fool me? What? I don't understand. I knew from the moment you stepped off that plane. You did? You, you knew? Of course. Anybody can see you're still in love with Judy, aren't you? Judy? Oh. Of course you are. I knew somehow you'd never forget her. 
But there's something on your mind, isn't there? I've noticed. Well, yes, there, uh, there is something on my mind. You want to go back to Mexico, don't you? To build a new laboratory. But you don't think it'd be right to ask Judy to go with you? Yeah, I, I, it's something like that. Why don't you ask her, Ted? She's very much in love with you. Is she? Oh, my goodness, you men. Can't you see it? Does a building have to fall on you before Excuse you... Me, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, what is it, Emily? There's a phone call for Mr. Brewster. Probably Judy. Uh, no, ma'am, it's a gentleman. Didn't give his name. I'm thinking it's the same one who was here this afternoon. Uh, excuse me. Oh, don't be long, dear. Hello? Mr. Brewster? Ted Brewster? Yes, who's this? An old friend, Ted. I would like to see you. Oh? I'm at the Carlton Apartments, 607 Crescent Place. Let us say around 10 o'clock, Ted. Now, look, what's this all about? Who's 607 the... Crescent Place, Apartment 3. It's very important, especially to you. Uh, hello. Hello. You stare at the telephone for a moment. Then slowly replace the receiver, your hand trembling. There's something about the voice, a familiar ring to it, but you can't place it. As you walk back to the dining room, you search your mind for a clue that will reveal the owner of that voice. But it's no use. A couple of hours after dinner is over, you make excuses to Aunt Louise and hurry out of the house. Quarter of an hour later, you arrive at 607 Crescent Place. You're tense and nervous as you ring the bell at apartment three. Hello, Ted. Wow. Surprise, my boy. Come in, come in. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. I was about to fix myself a drink. Will you join me? Oh, I'll, I'll take a rain check. Anything you say. What's on your mind, Doctor? You, you said it was important. So you want to have a drink, my boy? No, no, thanks. Well, here's to success. Yours... And mine, Jim. Jim, I... I don't follow you. Oh, now, come, come, Mr. Kinsella. Let us not play games. Uh, you're a little confused, Doctor. Uh, no, I don't think so. After all, this was my idea, Jim. Your idea? It wasn't a mistake, my giving you that face. I see. It was an inspiration, a challenge. I decided to gamble. You see, several years ago, I lost my license due to an unfortunate mistake. That's why I was in Mexico. Go on. I knew quite a bit about you, Jim. You and Ted Brewster and quite a few other people. It's a little hobby of mine, let us say. So? So I was certain that uh, you would see the opportunity I placed before you. The advantages of a new face, a new life, money. And now you want in. A ride on the gravy train. Exactly. Exactly. I expect to be paid for my services. Suppose I refuse. Oh, you would not be so stupid, my boy. I I could make things so very difficult for you. I could inform Mr. Brewster's aunt. And let me see, there is a girl, too. Judy. And uh, Mrs. Kinsella, your wife, in Mexico. I think she would like to know. I could tell them all this was your idea. And it was, Doctor. This I could deny. I could be properly horrified by the ghastly mistake I had made. My reason for coming here to the States, you see. After making one mistake, I wanted to be certain. How much do you want? Half. Half of Brewster's money. Half? Oh, not, not all at once, of course. I can be quite reasonable, my boy, and patient. Let us say the first payment shall be $5,000. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Oh, wait a minute. I can't get it that quickly. I... Uh, you will try, my boy. You will try very hard. Listen, if, you, if you'll give me till the end of the week... That is out of the question. I have certain things to take care of. Except... I must have the money tomorrow night. Uh, let us stay around uh, this same time. All right. All right, Doctor. You'll get it. As you leave Bauman's apartment, a plan begins to take shape in your mind. If you can stall him off for a few days, long enough for you to get a few thousand dollars, you can run away, can't you? Change your name. Bauman or the police will never find you. 
But you know, that would mean leaving Judy behind. And you don't want to do that. No, you really want to stay on here as Ted Brewster. You want to keep all the money for yourself. And you realize you're really in love with Judy. As you drive back to the house, you tell yourself there must be a way to prevent Bauman from ruining everything. You spend a sleepless night thinking about it. It stays with you the following day. And then that evening as you sit in the car with Judy, looking out over the ocean. Oh, it's been a perfect evening, Judy. Did you really mean what you said about Mexico? Going back with me, I mean? You know I did, darling. You're wonderful, Judy. Uh, what time is it? Why, it's a few minutes to nine. Why? Do you mind if we go back now? There's something I have to do. Tonight? Yes. Might as well get it over as soon as possible. Oh. All right, John. Whatever you say. No, I'll have to take care of this little matter before we can start making any plans, Judy. Uh, it's something I've got to do. A half hour after you've left, Judy... You're entering the apartment building on Crescent Street. You hurry upstairs to Dr. Bauman's apartment. Ring the buzzer. And as you wait, the hand in your coat pocket closes tightly around the gun. Well, my boy, right on time, I see. Hello, doctor. Come in. Uh, do you have something for me? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I have something for you, Dr. Bauman. But I don't think you're going to like it. Not one bit. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. It's over, isn't it, Jim? For what seems like hours, you stare at the lifeless body of Dr. Baum, dazed by what you've done. The one man who could strip the mask from your face, the only man who could reveal your true identity is dead. And so are you as Jim Kinsella. You've a new life before you now as Ted Brewster, with money, position, a wealthy aunt, and Judy, the girl who has promised to marry you. And now with one last look at Dr. Baum. Confident you're in the clear. You turn and start for the door. And then, as you open it... Hello. What is it? Homicide. We're looking for Dr. Bauman. Bauman? This is his apartment. Well, I, I'm sorry. He isn't in. Oh, isn't he? Well, that's too bad. We wanted to talk to him about an explosion. What? What? Yeah, at a chemical laboratory. I know the doctor quite well. Could could I help you? Can't you tell me what it's all about? The Mexican police ask us to check it for them. A few days back, a woman confessed that she persuaded Bauman to do a nasty little job for her a couple of months ago. A woman? Mm-hmm. Bauman's girlfriend. Seems she was tired of her husband, wanted him out of the way so she could marry Bauman. And last week, Bauman ran out on her. She got sore and tipped off the police. Tipped off the police? Yeah. To the explosion. And that Bauman was responsible for it. I guess she was just like a lot of other scorned women. Apparently, Mrs. Kinsella and the Mrs. doctor... Mrs. Kinsella? That's right. Bauman's girlfriend. Mrs. Jim Kinsella. Now, look, friend. We're coming in. No, I told you Bauman wasn't in. We know he is. We saw him come in. Now, come on. Out of the way. We want a murder, and we're going to get him. Yeah. I guess you are. Let that whistle be your signal for the whistler each Sunday night at the same time. Featured in tonight's story were Jeff Chandler, Francis Robinson, and Paul McVeigh. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, based on a story by Richard Creedon, 
with music by Wilbur Hatch. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.